Hello everybody and welcome to a dual review here on the channel with two books I'm very very excited to bring to you I'm sorry there's been a bit of a tick down in the frequency of reviews with my own writing and the move I just haven't had as much time to burn through some sci-fi fantasy epics but I've finished these two and I'm so excited to talk to them or talk to you about them. You know what I mean? We're getting into Fugitive Telemetry, the sixth book in the Murderbot Diaries and The Shadow of the Gods by John Gwynn. I'm very excited to uh, get into these and I have a lot to say. But first, we're gonna go ahead and start off with Fugitive Telemetry. If you've been paying attention at the channel at all recently, you know I like me some murder bot. Probably my favorite or second favorite ongoing sci-fi series at the moment. And Fugitive Telemetry is an interesting left turn for the character because a lot of the story elements, the overall arcs going on in these novellas have reached some form of conclusion with the most recent entries. And I was kind of wondering how much gas is gonna be left in the tank. Where's Martha Wells going to take the beloved murder bot? And I'm excited to say that because the legwork is so solid, there's such a firm foundation for this series to build off from. The pivot that we see narratively, in my opinion, just feels oh so natural, and it's not jarring at all. In fact, the growth of this character is now my favorite element to this novella. Watching Murderbot change and not become more calm. Well, yeah, he's more confident, more snarky than ever, is just brilliant. I said he again, damn it, no. They, it, my bad. And that's the beauty of Martha Wells' work here. Murderbot is just something that within the page feels like we're so close to it. We're so immersed in Murderbot's mind that the investment for this story, not only as it's a more like investigative detective type situation, which is just going to appeal to me on face value as a whole a lot, I get the satisfaction of watching this character I love so much have payoff for all the experiences it's been through up until this point. Point. And I'm very happy to say that one of the weakest elements I found early on within this series, relationships to Murderbot, are now not nearly as much as a weakness. Now the focus on relationships is something that enhances the overall story of Murderbot. And again, like I need to emphasize, this is the story of Murderbot. Like this is absolutely 100% narratively focused on the exploration and development of this character. So for me, and for character-driven readers, that's probably extremely appealing. There is the slight asterisk and caveat that still exists this many books in that I just want to emphasize where yeah there's, there's not necessarily if you're in like for the expanse experience that appeal in these pages there's some world building going on there's some of that like wonder of space for sure but it's just not what the intent is this is almost a character study it's an experiment in that sense so I get how so for some of the people who really get into sci-fi for these space operas may not not be satisfied here. This is not for the Dune lovers. This is more for the Dresden enthusiasts, you know, the people who really want to get as close into a character's mind as possible and watch them grow and that be where a lot of the enjoyment comes from. The action is something I haven't really talked about in Murderbot before, but I do want to take a minute to praise having this character who is so anxiety riddled. I mean, it's kind of built for war, but it has these like hesitations and human elements to it. And now we're watching it kind of just grow and develop. And so the inevitable result is I'm surprisingly, instead of becoming more numb to the action murder bot experiences, I'm almost more nervous for it as it gets into these situations because I relate to it and care about it through its development each book significantly more than the last. So now whenever it's having to commit violence or do something that's against its like overall needs, I just, my heart bleeds for it even more. That's such a interesting narrative element to Murderbot. And I'm curious to see if other readers will agree on it as well, or no, it's maybe been the reverse for you, or you know, you never felt more you know sympathy for Murderbot than at the very beginning. It's just, I'm surprised to say that the most human character I probably continue to read within the sci-fi genre is still 
murder bot. Funny enough, that's strange. This book's not out yet, so I can't really get into too many spoilers here, but I do want to say this is directly a more investigative story than we've ever had for Murderbot. It is standing up for itself in new ways, while not feeling like it's cheapening a lot of the uh, mental struggles the Murderbot has been going through up to this point, which is a very delicate balance to find, and I think Martha Wells has done so expertly. It's really almost inspiring to see an author find such a fantastic balance of mental health representation that doesn't hold back a character's growth, does never becomes a caricature, and allows a true delving into of psychology while talking about a freaking murder bot. And Fugitive Telemetry, while it is kind of like the start of something new for a murder bot, it almost feels like a new chapter, it also for me as a reader provided like closure in a sense for a lot of what we went through before with this character because yeah, a lot of the story stuff was wrapped up or kind of was found to a resolution recently. Not all of it, but a lot of it. And that kind of left me wondering what is for the future of this character and I got to see that here. Love that. Oh my gosh, that's great. It's a new chapter, but it, it kind of really nicely wraps up the previous. You get both here. But for those who have been maybe a little hesitant for Murderbot, wondering like, when are we going to get some other characters and relationships that are as fleshed out as maybe this series deserves? Don't worry, you're really going to start getting that here. The amount packed into this novella. Good lord. Overall, for Fugitive Telemetry, I'm feeling a rock-solid 8.5 out of 10. I didn't love the story as much as I did, but hey, it's the kicking off of something different, and I'm patient enough to see what's next. Let's talk about John Gwynn. The Shadow of the Gods by John Gwynn. I was really, really looking forward to this because my experience with John Gwynn so far has just been malice. And so when I heard like, oh, he's kicking off something a bit new that I could go to to see how he's improved as an author and have that direct contrast, I was so excited because reading Malice was already such a powerful example of an author. I'm not sure how much experience he had at that point, but it showed like a lot of promise and potential. It was a great book. So, oh, What's he gonna be able to do in 2021, this many years on? And I can tell you, he's written something that is going to be in my top books of the year. The Shadow of the Gods is truly an epic in every fashion, and I don't think has a weak spot. John Gwynn, wow. This man should be in the conversations with the best the genre has to offer today, and let's get into exactly why. So, this is not out, I won't get into spoilers, but The Shadow of the Gods is a Norse-inspired fantasy epic where we are following a hefty multi-POV cast of characters as they are going on their journey and we're learning about this world. And the balance there alone is pretty much flawless. It never feels like John Gwynn is over just overtly delivering information, but we are also, as an audience, given a absolutely just jaw-dropping insight into an exceptionally well-crafted fantasy world. And Norse mythology is a cool fantasy setting. It's not one that excites me as much as a lot of other possible cultures to pull from, but that stupid preference of mine did not stop this book from just making my head explode as some of the most epic fantasy writing I've come across in ages nearly blew this book out of my freaking hands. I'll get to some more of the details in a second. I just want to say, if this book was released a few decades ago, it would be in the talks with the greats of the greats of the genre, and it left me now wondering, just theorizing, trying to predict in a few decades, will it be able to overcome the steeper competition that exists now within the genre to still get that level of praise it deserves? Because this, to me, is just up there with like the oh my god, required reading for modern fantasy because it feels new and refreshing in a lot of the ways it handles character and the action. John Gwynn is debated the only person who writes action better right now in fantasy than Joe Abercrombie. These two are neck and neck for taking that title for me. Yet it's going to satisfy every single fantasy fan who still comes into the genre wanting what the classic appeal has to offer as well. It just has that full broad spectrum, just well done, well executed, pure fantasy that I don't see many people not really getting into. All right, let's go ahead and talk about what exactly this is. As I said, this is a multi-POV fantasy epic inspired by Norse mythology. The focus narratively is definitely on world building and character development, primarily here for it being a first book in a new series. And with the character development, okay. So John Gwynn gets talked about a lot for his action, which he should be. It, it's some of the best action you can read. But I want to specifically talk about how John Gwynn is an emotionally manipulating master. For me as an audience member, reading how quickly he is able to get me invested in Varg, 
it's spectacular. Varg and Orca were my favorite by far. Uh, I think those two characters will probably be within John Gwynn's fan base. New, just all time goat status, like talked about consistently. This book to me, it's funny. This is, he's, he's put out several pieces, but this read in a way where it felt like an author's baby, like something they had been wanting to put out for so, 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 so long. Maybe I'm just reading too much into it, but it, it, this this to me is John Gwynn like pure and distilled and refined to perfection. Okay, back to character stuff. Within like a page or two, I'm already caring about everyone he introduces consistently. John Gwynn, you, you blew my socks off with how just immediate and consistent you are with character introductions to audience investment. Truly impressive because there's like, it never felt overly preachy. It never felt like you're trying to pull my heartstrings, make me care about these people. But there's this natural narrative flow where I as a reader am just understanding why I should care. And I do, I think a hundred percent of the time. If I had one character complaint, it comes down to my own dyslexia because we have these really great <laughs> Norse names like Urka, Varg, and then there's Breka, Bre Breka, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to say it, dyslexia. But my dumbass brain just kept reading it as Becca. So there's this character who in my head, I'm like, Varg is talking to Becca, <laughs> which isn't accurate or right at all, but like, my brain did it, so I can't unsee it. <laughs> and Norse mythology, as I said, isn't something that necessarily gets me super excited for fantasy anymore, because it's something I've seen many times. But I was wrong to think that, because I need to remember, it doesn't matter what culture an author is pulling from. What matters is what they're doing with the culture, how they transform it, how they stay true to it, what, what themes and ideas they explore through the values they find while doing their research and things like that. And Again, there's not a weakness here in that sense. This is just, read it. <laughs> and Mr. Gwyn, Gw Gwyn Gwendolyn, J JG, John. The research that is prevalent for how well you understand the peoples you're pulling from and staying true while taking creative liberties and you know really having fun with the mythology available is something I'll be pointing a lot of my audience members to of how to do that correctly because I am struggling myself with how much research I should do and what's the balance of creative liberties and this is up there with the best of the best in terms of how well that's done because it never feels like exploitative or just you know taking liberties to the point where you're no longer actually representing the culture it's just immersed and extravagant in how it, it takes what is there, the foundations, and then uses the fantastic to uh, explore from. There's a quote from somebody, I forget who, involved in scientific fields, who was like, hey, if you're writing science fiction, start with what's true and then take creative liberties. It feels like you took a similar approach to culture. So. Yay. And on the flip side of all that praise about the people you're supposed to love, the people you're supposed to not love, uh, again, John Gwynn with his understanding of how to control readers' emotion makes you viscerally hate them and want them to die as his pen flows through. Oh, I'm never gonna write this good. Fuck. This book makes you wanna cry, punch a pillow, throw it across the room. It's a, it's a, it's wonderful. This is a naughty little boy right here. And if the cover wasn't enough to let you know, this book is Epic. And just like the terms of like where magic comes from and the feeling of the environment, it's there's like the dangerous powers, the gods are dead. It feels like there's just this power vacuum and that's kind of what's causing the conflict here. And you have like the bones of the deceased gods that it holds so much power. It, it, it's a bop. This is a bop. This is a, I want to make videos on it in the future and talk about it in depth bop. For out of 10 rating, I'm giving The Shadow of the Gods a 9.5 and a must read recommendation for me here. Uh, absolutely exquisite outing and has made me excited for every single thing this author is going to be doing in the future, as well as having a deeper drive to go through their past works. It's been a good reading couple weeks for me. Can you tell? Anyway, guys, thank you so much for tuning into this review. Like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you'd like to support what I do here. And have a good one, y'all. Peace.